الناس اللي بره خالص Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, good morning still. We haven't yet reached noon, and we are about to at any rate. I am deeply honored to be invited to present the, the first uh, lecture in this series. And specifically, I hope that you all will fasten your seat belts as I'm about to take you on a journey of 50 centuries of science in Egypt. And uh, I will do that at around a minute per century. So, <laughs> well, it's still 50 minutes. It's still a long lecture, but what can I say? This is Egypt, and this is Alexandria, so welcome. And uh, we'll introduce from the ancient Egyptians to the ancient library of Alexandria, to the Muslim and Arab Renaissance, of which there will be only a slightest uh, presentation here because George Saliba, of course, is going to be uh, the, is the expert and will be presenting some of that. Then a brief word about how the torch passed to Europe, but that Egypt in the 19th and 20th century had some rather unusual people in its Academy of Sciences. And then uh, the 21st century, and uh, with a great deal of lack of modesty, I will present the new Library of Alexandria as part of the 21st century uh, science in Egypt. So let me start with the ancient Egyptians. And of course, you know, from the earliest times, sedentarization took place around the uh, rivers, uh, whether it was here or in Iraq or in China. And uh, we are very proud in Egypt to have Imhotep. Imhotep is the is our great-grandfather, all of us, because he is the first human being, the first human being whose name was recorded and is known to us today, not because he was a king or a conqueror, but because of the product of his mind. He was an engineer who built the, the uh, step pyramid of Saqqara for uh, King Chaucer, in the dynasty preceding the great pyramid builders of Giza. He was also an eminent physician and later on became the god of medicine in Egypt. Now, ancient Egyptians, of course, had very advanced medical knowledge, known, of course, to the public through mummification. But these, from the Komombo temple, show you the instruments of, uh, of medical surgery, including scissors and cotton and other forms that existed. And these are probably the oldest set of false teeth that exist in the world, 4,500 years old, showing that dentistry also existed at that time. Uh, even at the time of the ancient uh, uh, pyramid builders, the Great Pyramid of Giza, next to it, of course, is the sun boat, uh, built uh, in, in, in um, the uh, again, uh, 4,400 years uh, ago, uh, 4,500 years ago, but clearly preceding those who could build boats like that must have been another couple of thousand years of developmental civilization. The pyramid itself is the only remaining wonder of the seven wonders of the ancient world that still stands. And what's amazing is to realize that until the Eiffel Tower was built, with late 19th century technology, it was the tallest building on earth, a record it held for millennia. And from our perspective, since so many here are astronomers, it's also remarkably precisely aligned, not just with the cardinal points, but also, as you can see here, the polar star onto the main passage to the underground chamber, and from these so-called ventilation shafts, alignment with Sirius, for other uh, uh, liturgy. Uh, the, the Dendera uh, uh, Zodiac, as it's known, or the calendar sometimes it's referred to, uh, shows how much mastery of astronomy they had, and they had already identified all of the uh, famous constellations, more or less. They had a rather complicated system of writing until we got what we now refer to as Arabic numerals, which are really Indian numerals that the Arabs adopted and transferred to the West. Uh, until we had that, most of the old systems were quite uh, clunky, 
in terms of the symbolism that they, they held. So if you were to write 1492, uh, that's how it would be written in uh, ancient Egyptian script. But uh, from the ceilings of the tombs, we know the extent of the knowledge of astronomy that they possessed. And they had also uh, house clocks for night and day. Uh, in day, you could tell by the sun. At night, you filled vessels with water, and it ran out at a certain pace, which kept markings to show you the hours that went by. Uh, mathematics were very advanced, and the Rhine papyrus, uh, written some 34 150 years ago, copied from a work about 400 years earlier, shows a large number of mathematical problems. It's uh, shown beautifully in the Kalshrama, which has been a creation of our Kaltnat Center, which is also exhibiting here. And Dr. Fathi Saleh, the leader of that uh, research institute, is here among us today. It showed how to solve problems. So the problem statement going from right to left in red is the problem statement. How do you find the area of a of a triangle, uh, so as an example, and then you go on to say, assume you have a triangle of a height of 10 het and the base of 4, what is the area? Well, you take half the base and this gives 2 so that you can square the triangle and you arrive at the, give you the area. Uh, other papyri, such as the Edwin Smith papyrus, shows an enormous amount of knowledge about medical information from as early as 3000 BC. Uh, this particular one involves a textbook on trauma surgery and uh, the first descriptions of the cranial sutures, the menage, the external surface of the brain, and uh, the, the uh, cerebrus fluid. Uh, the Ebers papyrus uh, recognizes the heart as a center of the blood supply with vessels for every member of the body. But most interestingly, mental disorders such as depression and dementia are covered in the Ebers papyrus and treated as diseases. An incredibly modern view, if one can use such an expression. There are also chapters on contraception, diagnosis of pregnancy, other gynecological matters. Now, from the ancient Egyptians, uh, the Greeks learned a lot, and some of the great Greeks, like Plato and Pythagoras, visited uh, ancient Egypt, visited the temples and the libraries that were open there to scholars. And of course, then they mounted that edifice of uh, the golden Greeks that we refer to as the heyday of ancient Greece. Greek science and philosophy, starting with Thales and Pythagoras and Democritus and Eudoxus and others, were really an amazing uh, uh, body of knowledge and edifice of knowledge was created until reaching, of course, the two great philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, where Aristotle did sort of classification of knowledge, the universal knowledge in many ways. But Aristotle had a special student. And that's where we are going to move to our next chapter, because that student was Alexander the Great. Can you guys just imagine what it must have felt like to be tutored personally by Aristotle? Just reflect on that for a while. Then you go on to conquer the world. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you haven't conquered the world yet, that's probably because you didn't have the right uh, tutor <laughs> at school. So anyway, Alexander and his friend uh, uh, Ptolemy were also tutored by, was, was tutored by Aristotle. And he went on and did conquer the world. And he, this is the uh, height of uh, the peak of the Alexandrian Empire. And what is striking, of course, is that all of this was on foot. They actually covered all of this on foot. It's an amazing achievement by any stretch of the imagination. But Alexander, what he did is a, a transformation of the world because he brought together all the cultures of the East and the West, so from Greece to, to Asia and back to Egypt. And uh, Ptolemy, the first Soter, is the one who built Alexandria because Alexander just selected the spot. Actually, he stood very close to, if you cross the Corniche and you stand right next to the uh, uh, harbor, that is where Alexander stood, giving his back to the piece of land that we call the Silsila, which is referred to as Keplochias. He looked on the other side and he could see as far as the lake and the fresh water there, and he decided this is where I want to build my city. Uh, so after his death, his empire was divided, and Ptolemy 
took this part of the empire, which you see here, and uh, that became the empire of Ptolemy. Alexander himself, that was his trip into Egypt, he came here, selected the site of Alexandria, went to Paritonium, down to Siwa, where he was declared the god, and he adopted the ancient Egyptian religion, and then he went back to Memphis and out of Egypt, and then returned only as a body. Now, this is the ancient Alexandria, and this is the Silsila, which is in front of us, and where the royal palaces were built, and the new library is right here, right now. Now, probably the old library was somewhere here, and the next building came here. But what we do know is this is where the fort is and where the old uh, uh, pharos used to exist. And then uh, this was an island, the island of Pharos, connected by a heptastadion, 1.2 kilometers, which later on filled in on both sides, creating the eastern and western uh, harbors of today. Uh, all visitors to ancient Alexandria said there were two marvels. There was a, a, the Pharos and the library. The Pharos has been imagined in many ways. This is not an accurate way, but it's a famous one from, from Erlach in 1721. This is the most accurate reconstruction of the Pharos uh, uh, based on uh, the work of uh, uh, some distinguished uh, uh, archaeologists. This is a reconstruction imagined by the late Carl Sagan at the time of his series Cosmos on what the ancient library of Alexandria may have looked like. We don't know for sure. We know that it, had, uh, it was a temple to the muses and it was open and we had columns and racks for books. So this is another view of how it was imagined to be. And this is a celebratory coin on the third part that dealt with the daughter library. But what is striking there is you will look at this column capital here, you'll see it in a moment. Now the story of the ancient library starts with Demetrius of Phaleron, who was a former tyrant of Athens. Tyrant at the time was a title, it didn't have the connotations that uh, it has today. Uh, there was a tyrant of Syracuse and the tyrant of Athens and so on. Uh, but he had been ousted. He was an academic who had dabbled in politics. He had been ousted, so he was kind of in between jobs when Ptolemy asked him to come as an advisor. And he came up with this brilliant idea and he told uh, Ptolemy, if you want Alexandria to be the greatest city in the world, then bring the greatest minds in the world and then give them nothing to do. Uh, this is kind of a, an unusual idea. But after all, it's the idea that's being followed today in the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton and other institutions of that kind. You get an Einstein and uh, an Oppenheimer and you bring them in and you tell them, do what you like. So Ptolemy agreed. And they built the Temple to the Muses, or the Museum in Latin, Museon in Greek, which was part academy, part uh, research institute, part library, all of that together, and part university, because they were teaching. And it was under Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, that there was a huge expansion in the library, and it reached its universal status under his reign, because he ruled for 42 years. And they had scrolls, and these scrolls would take seven to eight of these scrolls, would be about one book of 300 pages of modern typescript that is quite tightly packed, and the library held about 700,000 scrolls arranged in storage racks. So that was the marvel that many other people referred to when they came. Now, the original museum had a botanical garden, a zoological garden, a dissection room, residential quarters, covered walkways, a courtyard where the scientists would speak, and a library. And the library grew and grew and grew. And so they built a second building next to the harbor, which is important for the history of the library. And that second uh, building of the, of the harbor was called the Biblion. And then over here in the temple to Sarapis, they would build a daughter library uh, attached to a temple to the god Sarapis. This is the foundation uh, uh, stone, the gold leaf from the foundation stone inscription of the Serapeum, and you will notice that it is in Greek and in Pharaonic hieroglyphs. And uh, it's good that the Ptolemies used both languages because they also gave us the Rosetta Stone, which of course enabled the deciphering of the hieroglyphs later on. Serapis, god of Alexandria, was an interesting character 
because as far as I know, he's the only God who was created by committee. And uh, the founders of Alexandria wanted very much a deity that would be acceptable to Egyptian communities and Greek communities, so they created a committee of uh, priests from both sides who created a composite god uh, that had features of uh, uh, Osiris and Apis and Zeus and Dionysus, and he happily ruled over Alexandria as the cult god of Alexandria for seven centuries, and everybody seemed to like him quite well until the rise of the Middle Ages when they burnt down the temple. So the library, at the very least, the ancient library was in three places, and it continued its heyday until Cleopatra. Uh, now, the ancient library really married Greek and Egyptian science with Asian elements added, produced an explosion of knowledge probably unmatched in history. Kalimachos, the great poet of the Hellenistic period, uh, produced uh, you know, my predecessor, Eratosthenes, whom you all know, uh, said to him, poetry is something you do as a sideline, do something useful, and write a catalog about the library. So uh, he put him to work, and Kalimachos produced 120 uh, volume Pinakes, in which what he did was to, for the first time, organize universal knowledge by subject, then by author inside the subjects, and then alphabetically among the authors. So he became the father of library science, and certainly the father of bibliographies, which we do to this day in the same manner. Aristarchus was probably the first human being ever who said that the earth revolves around the sun, not the other way around. He had a heliocentric century uh, cosmological model. Hipparchus calculated the length of the solar year to within six and a half minutes. An amazing feat if you consider uh, 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 the instruments that they had in those days. And he also created the first broad atlas that existed. Uh, now, Eratosthenes was the, the third director of the ancient library. And uh, he was kind of an unusual uh, polymath. He did everything. He was the father of geography in many ways. And he was also an astronomer, a mathematician, and he was known as a grammarian, which meant that he was also uh, a specialist on Homer, critiquing Homer. Uh, he measured the distance to the sun uh, and the distance to the moon and computed the distance using data during lunar eclipses and measured the tilt of the Earth axis very, very closely to the actual value of 23 and a half degrees. Uh, his most famous experiment uh, was to calculate the circumference of the Earth uh, based on a piece of knowledge that in Aswan on the 21st of June, that you looked in a deep well, there was no shadow, you put a stick on the ground, there was no shadow. And from that piece of information and observing that there were shadows in Alexandria, he was able to deduce that, first of all, the, air, the Earth was curved, not flat, and then calculate the circumference of the Earth in proportion to the angle of uh, uh, shadows in Alexandria, based on the assumption that the sun was so far away that uh, it would be, uh, uh, the rays would be parallel. Uh, we redo this experiment with children here in Alexandria and in Aswan, and this year, Omar Fikri, I believe we had nine other locations from around the world who were all connected by video conferencing. All the kids were doing their, their calculations at the same time. Uh, you compare that, for example, with the Renaissance illustration that shows still Thalese's notion of a flat earth floating on water or fears that some people had that uh, you could sail off the edge of the earth. Now, how accurate were Eratosthenes' calculations depends very largely on uh, the exact uh, uh, measure of the stadia that you take, because he reported his findings in stadia. Uh, there have been uh, Gulbekian mentioned 166, others mentioned uh, Pliny. I take Pliny's uh, calculation, and Pliny's calculation gives us uh, uh, over 98% accuracy for the circumference of the Earth and over 80% accuracy for the distance to the sun. Remarkable achievements by any measure, comparable certainly to Hipparchus's calculation of the length of the solar year to six and a half minutes 
of the 365 days and a quarter approximate figure. So if you think for a moment about the, the, the instruments or the lack of instruments that they had in those days, these are awesome scientific achievements. Absolutely awesome till today. Eratosthenes also used his mind to challenge a lot of reports about different sizes and uh, the approximate sizes of different parts that were reported by travelers. And this is the map of the world as he knew it and as he was constructing it in his time. He also explained the Nile flood. Now, the Nile flood, of course, was known, recorded, measured all along, but he was the first one who postulated that it was probably due to seasonal rains somewhere upland uh, 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 upstream in, in uh, the south, and that this was the rainwaters traveling through Egypt reaching the sea, which is, of course, the accurate explanation. Uh, he also uh, created human geography, and uh, in what is now Yemen, which he referred to as Udaiman Arabia, uh, he defined the different races, including the Menians, the, the Hadramites, uh, and the Sabaeans and the uh, Atomites. So it's, uh, it's quite amazing that already in that time he was defining tribes, calculating uh, distances to, to the stars and organizing human geography. But with all due respect to Aristarchus, to Hipparchus, to Eratosthenes, it is another guy, Claudius Ptolemy, who would have the most lasting effect and uh, Dr. George Saliba <laughs> will be able to say something about that because, uh, you know, he brought back the Earth to the center of the universe and uh, the Ptolemaic system was to preside and rule over the world for the next thousand years or more. Uh, and uh, it is uh, indeed uh, uh, unfortunate, but it was through his master work called the Almagest in its Arabic, uh, Majesty in Arabic translation, which dominated throughout the Middle Ages until Copernicus. Uh, the Earth at the center of the cosmos was uh, a view that he maintained, and uh, until uh, uh, even with Galileo, as we all know, uh, who tried to challenge that system in support of Copernicus, it didn't last very well. I forgive him, however, this act because of his marvelous work on geography. Gorafia, my friend Yusuf Zidane is here, I see. He knows the Gorafia very well. Look at the beauty of his design of the Nile, including all the way to the mountains of the moon, and they're just lacking Lake Victoria uh, here. So the ancient Egyptians and Greeks and Asians and others who visited and stayed in the library, like uh, uh, Archimedes, gave us a completed calendar, which was the same calendar that existed in ancient Egypt, but formulated in a very precise way, and which was adopted by Julius Caesar as a Julian calendar. And among the other things that they produced was Euclid's elements, which remains, of course, the longest uh, textbook of science that is still being used everywhere in the world. We still learn Euclidean geometry at school. Archimedes was a visiting professor. Would that he had stayed. Uh, he may not have been murdered, uh, went back to Syracuse. He should have stayed longer. And while he was here, of course, I mean, not, that's his famous story of the crown and the Eureka. And he worked on levers and his famous statement about raising, uh, give me a place to stand, I'll move the earth. But en passant, he gave us the Archimedean screw to help Egyptians raise water from the Nile. And as you can see, it is still being used 2,200 years later. Herophilus conducted detailed postmortems and identified the brain as the controlling organ of the body, not the heart, as Aristotle had said. And even Galen, who served as a doctor to gladiators in Pergamon, uh, came to study in Alexandria later on. The herbarium of Discorides was uh, uh, one of the important sources of uh, medical knowledge for pharmacopoeia. And Maneto, the great historian, uh, was the chronicles of the pharaohs, and he organized the history of Egypt by dynasties, which we still use today. So when we say this is a pharaoh from the 18th dynasty, or so on, we are using the classification that Maneto organized in the ancient library. 
Diophantus, his work is now being more and more appreciated, his arithmetic uh, uh, work. In fact, it was on that book that Fermat wrote in the margin of his copy of Diophantus that he wrote his famous last theorem claiming that uh, uh, he had a wonderful uh, proof for it which couldn't be fitted in the margin. Uh, and that kept mathematicians busy for 300 years. But the work of Euclid and Diophantus is early precursor of modern encryption work. Now, the, in the ancient library, people were open to other ideas, and the it, translation work was very prominent. And the first translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek, the Septuagint, took place here in the ancient library of Alexandria. And the early church fathers, Clement of Alexandria and his pupil Origen, uh, were trying to do uh, a marriage between philosophy and theology uh, that would be outlawed during the, the Middle Ages and would find its way back into church doctrine only after the Renaissance. Uh, education was uh, uh, co-equal. Girls studied there. This is a student. And actually, you find several statues in our museum. We have that. And this is not a laptop. This is a slate. I keep being asked this question, what does she have in her lap? Does she have a laptop? No, she didn't have a laptop, she has a slate. So little remains physically, but it, was, uh, uh, it still continues to inspire us. So when was it destroyed? Well, contrary to popular uh, myth uh, uh, perpetrated by some uh, scholars, it was not destroyed by the Arabs in the seventh century because it had disappeared centuries earlier. Recall that it was in three locations. And so our first disaster occurs with Julius Caesar in 48 BC, coming into Alexandria in pursuit of Pompey. Uh, he finds a, a divided country where Cleopatra's brother had just kicked her out, and so she had herself smuggled into a carpet. We all know that story. They unravel the carpet, and there she is, and she convinces Julius Caesar to stand by her. And uh, he does, and that uh, leads to the Alexandrian War in which all the fleets of Egypt and Rome are burnt. And as a result of this conflagration here, unintentionally, the library building that was next to the harbor is burnt, and that is the first big fire of the library, 48 BC. Now, depending on who you read, 40,000, 100,000, 400,000 scrolls were lost, but some loss there was. Now, uh, I must say something about Cleopatra because she's not at all the image that uh, Shakespeare and Hollywood give us of her. She was actually not particularly beautiful. She was a very brainy lady uh, who spoke five languages, who did arithmetic, wrote poetry, which for a princess in her time was a remarkable education. And uh, the proof of what I have to say it comes from the rest of the story. We all know of the death of Caesar, followed by Mark Antony, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him, etc., etc. Now, Antony ruled the Eastern Empire and Octavian the Western Empire. And Antony, therefore, as emperor, was also very taken by Cleopatra. This is Antony Hollywood version. This is Antony real. And this is Cleopatra Hollywood version. And this is Cleopatra real. So uh, what's important is that uh, why Caesar and Anthony were so taken by Cleopatra was her charisma, her education, her character. And you have to remember, they were masters of the world. They could have had, if it was just a matter of sex, they could have had any slave girl they wanted from the vast empires that they ruled. No, they were taken by her personality. And the proof of that is that to, to, uh, what was the way for Antony to get to Cleopatra's heart? He gave her the 200,000 scrolls of Pergamon Library as a gift to the Library of Alexandria. Now, what kind of a woman is it whose way to her heart is a massive book donation to the library? <laughs> My kind of woman! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's please rehabilitate the memory of Cleopatra from being a flighty woman, uh, femme fatale, to being really a conscious 
queen who tried to keep the independence of Egypt for as long as possible. But it was true that there was a famous love story between her and Antony, made famous by scribes all over. They lost their battle in a battle of Actium, uh, where the fleet, Egyptian fleet, was destroyed, and uh, Octavian moved on, and uh, they both committed suicide, and then Octavian took over Egypt, became the uncontested ruler of the empire as Augustus, and established the, the Pax Romana, and uh, Egypt became a Roman province. And then, immediately after that, St. Mark brings Christianity to Alexandria, and it ensues a period of enormous persecution by the Romans. And as a result of that, in fact, to this day, the Coptic calendar starts from 293 AD, not from year zero as we would expect, because it is known as the year of the martyrs. So much suffering was meted on the Christians by the Romans in that part. Queen Zenobia, another remarkable lady, comes from Palmyra, or Tadmor, in Syria, and uh, she conquered Alexandria, and the Alexandrians welcomed her, and she held Alexandria until Emperor Aurelian came back to put order. Now, I don't have to tell you what an emperor, Roman emperor did when he came back to put order into something, uh, but they completely wiped out the entire ro royal quarter, and there was nothing left, including the museum. So the second part disappeared in 272 AD, as did the entire royal quarter, because historians tell us he left no stone over the other. And that gives you, all of you here, as long as you're in Alexandria, if you want to enjoy yourself and you have a little bit of the, of the Indiana Jones spirit in you, we have for you the most important question of archaeology still unanswered. Where is the tomb of Alexander the Great? It's here somewhere. Under one of those, uh, it, was, it was actually right here at the intersection of these two streets. And where is that? It's somewhere underneath the buildings in downtown Alexandria. So maybe if you go to a basement, you'll discover something, who knows? And that left, anyway, after that destruction, that left only the daughter library over here in the temple to Sarapis. And that continued till 391 AD, uh, when uh, Emperor Theodosius issued a decree making Christianity the only religion allowed in the Roman Empire. And since uh, Sarapis was a pagan god, uh, Bishop Theophilus went and burnt it down the Serapium. And there's the, this uh, uh, manuscript from the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna shows uh, Theophilus standing over the burning Serapium. Orosius confirms that in 415 AD. And so that was the end of the ancient library in, in 391. What remained were a few manuscripts in the hands of the scholars themselves who for one more generation coexisted uneasily with an increasingly aggressive and uh, church with uh, uh, enormous zealotry. And that brings us, of course, to Hypatia, daughter of Theon, last recorded scholar of Alexandria, and uh, herself a Neoplatonist philosopher, a... a, a, a an eminent figure in every way, mathematician, astronomer, and uh, apparently a very beautiful lady, much appreciated by the Bishop of Tripoli, not appreciated by the Bishop of Alexandria. Uh, the death of Hypatia has been uh, captured in, uh, in a novel by Dr. Zidane called Azazil, and in a film recently issued called Agora, and many other things. But the end of the library is either 391 with the destruction of the Serapium or with the murder of Hypatia, whichever way you want to take it. So, as you can see, it's one long decline, but uh, through a series of major events, and uh, it was all gone way before even the birth of the Prophet Muhammad uh, or the arrival of Amr ibn al-As in Egypt. So, uh, that's the story of the ancient library in, in, in general and what it has contributed. Uh, this was not unusual because this was the beginning of the Dark Ages in Europe. The church was then uh, asserting its influence, which as we know would continue even to the extent of putting Galileo on trial as we know later on. 
Now, what did it do? It produced a lot of things. What is left today, fragments of the past and dreams. There's very little left physically. This is the Serapium, where you can go on the other side of Alexandria. Uh, we call it Amud al-Sawari now, but you find the remnants there. But underwater, in the harbor, we are discovering new things. And look at that column. Doesn't that remind you of the column I showed you on that coin at the beginning? It could be a very same one. Who knows? What we do know is that we fished out of the water the statue of Ptolemy II, this colossal statue, and we brought him back to the entrance of the new library. So his library, in a sense, as we continue. So our stories would have started with the wife of Ptolemy I, Berenike, who insisted on getting Ptolemy II to rule. Uh, later on, we, we uh, get uh, Cleopatra, we get uh, uh, Zenobia, we get Hepatia, and the revival of the new library also required the intervention of a remarkable lady, Mrs. Suzanne Mubarak, without whom this project would not have been completed the way it is and the library would not exist, and she's now our current chair of the board. So what happened after the library disappeared? Well, uh, I have two questions. One is, of course, that the Arabs and Muslims were going to revive the flame of learning and turn Arabic into the language of science for the Middle Ages. And uh, it came into its own. Iran and Central Asia played pivotal roles. And Egypt would flourish during this period and dominate the Arab world after the destruction of Baghdad. Now, we are talking about Baghdad of the Arabian Nights. We have to think of the enormous glory that Baghdad was in those days. And uh, uh, the story is really not just of Baghdad, but of how an institution very much like the ancient library, it the Hikmah, the House of Wisdom, was recreated by the son of Harun al-Rashid al-Ma'mun. And I frequently ask my Western friends, if the ancient library was destroyed, how come we have this heritage to this day? If it was all destroyed, how come we have it? Well, we have it thanks to this guy, who probably, using the profiling methods of the previous administration in the United States, would have been considered a terrorist. He was, after all, half Iranian, half Arab, living in Baghdad and head of the Muslims. A profile that you would not normally have associated with the greatest savior of Western knowledge. But he did. That was the vast empire that he ruled from Morocco to India, uh, with the exception of parts of, of uh, Morocco and, uh, and Spain. And uh, what he did was that he launched this enormous campaign of translation. Uh, and he said, anybody who translates an old manuscript will receive its weight in gold. So what resulted from that is anybody who had a manuscript somewhere in Cairo, in Tunis, etc., would take it back to Baghdad, have it translated, and get its weight in gold. And of course, the finance minister, the vizier at the time, told him, you know, Mir uh, al-Mu'minin, the, the scholars are cheating. They are writing in big letters on thick paper to get more weight. But enlightened as he was, he said, let them be, for what they give us is worth much more than what we give them. I keep telling that story to my finance minister, but it doesn't impress him a bit. <laughs> but it was true. This was a period where the ruler was allowed, in fact, this largesse towards what was to become one of the greatest scientific centers in the world. And many of the codexes which we now have are really uh, through their Arabic translations that we have received them. And everything was translated. Everything that you could think of was translated into Arabic. And Arabic became the language of uh, science and knowledge in the Middle Ages for a very long time. This is Discorides' medicinal plants. And these are medieval libraries. And I love this. You see all these little books sitting there in these quadrangles there, there in the cubicles. There are all these books. And there are all the scholars. There's someone reading a book here and others arguing with him. Um, not much has changed, Dr. Yusuf. <laughs> there we are <laughs> still. And the astronomers, and the astronomers with their books here and their instruments, and as you can see, vehemently arguing. And a healthy debate, of course, is what makes great scholarship. 
Now, the Arabic numerals triumphed over the uh, Roman numerals that existed in the, in the Latin world and very quickly were adopted, but uh, this is a 15th century drawing of a competition between uh, someone using an abacus and someone using Arabic numerals. But the, the Arabs and Muslims saw an explosion of knowledge, a revival that started from the 8th and 9th century, uh, reached peak in the 9th century, Jabir ibn Hayyan, uh, who died at the beginning of the 9th century, is really one of the fathers of chemistry, uh, at Tabari, uh, medicine, mathematics, calligraphy, history, al Razi in medicine. And uh, Dr. Yusuf, you have uh, published a multilingual translation of his work on gout on gout. So anybody, we have a copy of that if you're interested. And Al-Farabi, sociology, logic, philosophy, uh, he referred to Plato and Aristotle as Al-Hakimain and uh, called on their uh, work uh, as needed. And uh, Zahrawi was uh, known as Al-Buqasis uh, in surgery, in medicine. And then uh, in Persia and Iran, we have uh, Buzjani, but I'm not going to say anything about that because Dr. Saliba will say a lot more about that period, Biruni. And Ibn Sina, of course, is known for medicine, philosophy, mathematics. He's the author of Al-Qanun, which was probably the most influential uh, uh, book on medicine. Omar Khayyam, who we know for his uh, quatrains of poetry, uh, but uh, he was a brilliant mathematician and astronomer. The Jalali calendar is supposed to have been better than the, the Julian and all the way comparable to the Gregorian adjustment later on. Khwarizmi, through his work in Kitab al-Jabr al-Muqabala, algebra, father of algebra, and uh, he was a distinguished mathematician and astronomer, and we use, from his name, we have derived algorithm to, to this day. And possibly one of the greatest minds of the Middle Ages was Ibn al-Haytham known as Al-Hassan in the West. He was born in Basra but made his career in Cairo. And uh, he did really a lot of things. For one thing, he challenged the idea of the authority of the ancients and relied on the experimental method. He invented the modern experimental method. And listen to his powerful voice as he says, he who searches for truth is not he who reviews the work of the ancients. It is he who follows argument and evidence, not the statement by an individual who is inevitably affected by context and imperfection. He did experiments. Here he is looking at the refraction of light, which makes the stick appear bent uh, in that experiment. And uh, his work influenced Kepler. Uh, he, among other things, said that we see because a ray gets into our eye, not because it comes out of our eyes. He studied the eye and the, the, did the, these uh, anatomical sketches of the eye. But the most important thing is he invented what we refer to today as the modern scientific method, observation, hypothesis, prediction, experiment, interpretation. And then you either reject or you start all over again or you consolidate. Uh, here is the description. We start by observing reality. We try to select solid, unchanging observations that are not affected by how we perceive them. We then proceed by increasing our research and measurement, subjecting premises to criticism, and being cautious in drawing conclusions. In all we do, our purpose should be balanced, not arbitrary, the search for truth, not the support of opinions. Now that is from the 10th century. 600 years before Galileo. And I defy anyone to tell me that this is not a very precise description of the modern experimental method. In fact, uh, Galileo and Descartes and uh, Bacon and others who would adopt all of that uh, suffered for it. Galileo was put on trial and had to recant, as we all know, in 1633. But it was that presence and that openness in the Middle Ages that allowed Muslim and Arab science to flourish. Now, Ibn al-Haytham also recognized human frailty and error, and he said, yet we are but humans, so subject to human frailties against which we must fight with all our human might. God help us in all our endeavors. Why does he say that? Because sometimes subject, subjective prejudice finds its way, as we found in Broca's work, eminent scientist of the 19th century, who went about measuring brains and trying to prove that the brains of white people were superior to the brains of yellow and black people. 
and uh, so on. In the meantime, Ibn Nafis, uh, whom uh, Yusuf Zidane translated 30 volumes of, edited 30 volumes of uh, his work Al Shamil in medicine, is uh, uh, also the person who made this beautiful statement about listening to the contrarian view. When hearing something unusual, do not preemptively reject it, for that would be folly. Indeed, horrible things may be true and familiar and praised things may prove to be lies, for truth is truth unto itself, not because many people say it is. The word folly in Arabic is taish, he uses taish. So it is a, a, a remarkable statement uh, compared with those who were defending orthodoxy in Europe at the time. Now, throughout that period, of course, throughout the Middle Ages, uh, Muslims uh, continue to do masterpieces of uh, art and science. And Dr. Fathi Saleh here has done an enormous amount from the, the Skyriders exhibitions to other things about astrolabs. And there is a 3D exhibit, which I hope you've seen downstairs, of astrolabs and many other things that we'll see later on. Uh, we talked about how the, these uh, 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 scientists and astronomers in the Muslim world studied uh, 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 the ancients, but they also did their own studies. In fact, it's uh, uh, quite interesting to discover how much of an influence they had. Uh, they used, of course, uh, astronomy and uh, observation to try to define the beginning of the lunar month and the, the cyclical calendar. And everything was going great until, of course, a gradual decline led to an openness, and the Mongols under Hulagu came and destroyed Baghdad in 1258. Now, in the, facing that enormous uh, horde, Al-Tusi stood up, and I say this to people who tell me, oh, you know, looking for grant money is so hard, and so on. I said, what's so hard about that? All, you can, all they can do is tell you no. Al-Tusi went and spoke to Hulagu, who had just burnt Baghdad to the ground, killed practically everybody who was there, made pyramids out of the skulls, and the aesthetics of the pyramids were to turn the faces outward, and went and convinced him to invest in science. Now, come on, you've got to admit that this is harder than applying for a grant today. And he did. He got, uh, he got him, in fact, to build Maraga, the great Maraga school, which would continue as one of the most famous centers of astronomy well into the 17th century. And uh, Dr. Saliba has written in his classic work in 1993 uh, on astronomy that in a way we may even consider Copernicus the, the last of the Maraga astronomers <laughs> or in any way connected with that. His work was very connected with that. These uh, astrolabs, I invite you to see them. They are really combinations of enormous artwork as well as enormous scientific precision. These are not astrolabs, this is a, a sundial, and this is an armillary. And these are maps that were created. Uh, this particular one uh, was drawn uh, for uh, Roger the uh, second of Sicily, uh, and this is uh, the translations of other documents. I'll just skip through these documents. Hospitals, medicine, many other things existed. Ibn Khaldun, the father of sociology, is also, we are now discovering, had great observations on natural history and the evolution of species. And his Muqaddimah remains one of the great works to this day. Ibn al shatir did very detailed mathematical critique of Ptolemaic system. But still, as far as I could make out, he did not actually propose a heliocentric system, although the transposition is still possible. But anyway, I leave all these questions to Dr. Saliba, who is the expert on that. So oh, Copernicus launches a new era, as we know, but whatever he's going to do afterwards in Europe, we can't forgive, forget the Arab Islamic contribution to astronomy. And in the Kalcharama prepared by Kaltnat and Dr. Fathi Saleh is here, is the fact that you look at uh, a lot of these uh, stars and they have names that are not very understandable. Alula, Tanya, it almost sounds like a Russian girl, but actually this is the first in Arabic, Tanya is the second, Talitha is the third. So these are Latinizations of Arabic names and uh, because about 45% of the named stars were named 
by, by uh, Arab astronomers. So Raslas doesn't mean anything, but Ras to Leif means the head of the lion. And you can go through all of these and you'll see the amount of the contribution that existed everywhere. Now, even the time of decline that we refer to as the, the, the period of decline, we still find some interesting things. Uh, time zones and date lines, an interesting concept, since time zones did not really get formally instituted until the 19th century. But we find this observation from Madian al-Qawsuni in the 17th century in Egypt. He was a medical man. But he said if three travelers meet, three people meet in one place, and one travels this side and one travels that side and they turn around the earth and come back again, one will have a difference of one day with the other. The two travelers will have a difference of one day. And this leads us to the question, is it possible that one day is Friday for one person and Thursday for another or still Saturday in another location? And the answer is we think yes, which shows a remarkable degree of imagination and openness and understanding at that time. So contacts continued, reflection on problems continued, but it's clear that after the beginning of the Ottoman Empire, the East went into a form of decline and the West was ascendant from Copernicus onwards with Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Maxwell, Einstein, all the great scientists developing the great theories of science that we know from cosmology to particle physics, from chemistry to biology, the new sciences that we know of in that period. But that doesn't mean that in Egypt, science came to a standstill. In fact, with the roar of the cannon and the arrival of a young man of unlimited ambition, unlimited ability, and unlimited energy, Egypt was reawakened from its slumbers at the end of the 18th century. Napoleon Bonaparte arrived with 35,000 soldiers and 150 scientists in 1798. And the first thing he did in Cairo was to found the Academy of Science of Egypt, the Institut d'Egypte in 1798, and which was the first head was Gaspard Monge, the mathematician, and uh, the vice president was a certain Napoleon Bonaparte, and uh, the uh, secretary general was Fourier. Fourier, of course, of the Fourier series, Fourier transforms, those of you who deal with mathematics know that, and also the heat equations, and also the first person to have talked about greenhouse effect and the impact of gases in the atmosphere in his 1820 to 1827 cycle of publications. Uh, our academy, l'Institut d'Egypte, as you see here, has as its logo, 1798, the oldest academy of science outside of Europe, with the possible exception of the Philosophical Society by Franklin in Philadelphia. But aside from that, it would be the oldest. And uh, this guy was a former member of our academy. But he had other things <laughs> to his name, which <laughs> we don't normally mention, but he was, after all, uh, a, a former member of our Academy of Sciences. Uh, out of the, the expedition came not only the description de l'Egypte, but the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, a period of chaos uh, uh, ensued. Then Muhammad Ali Basha took over Egypt and launched an enormous reform. Uh, the reform of Muhammad Ali Basha was, became a model for a lot of people throughout the 19th and early part of the 20th century. He sent uh, people with Rifaat Tahtawi as a, as a uh, uh, spiritual guide along with the students who went to Paris to study, producing a generation of people like Ali Basha Mubarak, who would later on uh, uh, play a major role in, in modernizing education, Ali Ibrahim who would Arabize uh, uh, medicine. Uh, this is the first generation of Egyptian doctors who took over from the British in Egypt. Mustafa uh, Musharrafa, Ali Mustafa Musharrafa, the first person who, first North African to have completed the doctorate in mathematics. Uh, great people like Tahsin carried on the tradition and became actually head of our Academy of Science as well as the Academy of Arabic for certain periods of time. And then the revolution of 1952 would expand the support in Egypt for education, bringing in a lot of things, many new institutions, massive expansion, many fellowships to study abroad, but also lead to periods of political upheavals and the emergence of our distinguished diaspora of which Farouk al-Baz is one of our most distinguished examples. 
Farouk, uh, uh, a graduate of Ain Shams University, went on, in fact, to uh, teach the astronauts geology and to select landing sites for the moon. But he is named. He, he has achieved the greatest notoriety, not just because of, 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 of scientific publications, but he was recognized in Star Trek. You don't believe me? Look at this. This is the Elbaz pod on Star Trek, named after Farouk Elbaz. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, our, our very own Farouk Elbaz. <laughs> Now, when Hollywood pays homage, Farouk, that is the ultimate homage you get. So, uh, we have many other distinguished friends. Uh, Sir Magdi Aqoub was, uh, was knighted by the Queen, and the BBC, uh, less dramatically than Star Trek, had a special documentary on him called The King of Hearts, uh, because of his heart surgery. <laughs> And uh, he has established here at the library a center of, uh, of genetic uh, analysis for uh, uh, HCM. Dr. Ahmed Zouel, well, he would, in fact, go on at, towards the end of the century and receive the Nobel Prize in 1999, as you can see uh, here in Stockholm receiving the Nobel Prize. Uh, and Dr. Mustafa Sayed received the Medal of, of Science from the President of the United States. So, Egyptian science, through this diaspora of distinguished Egyptians who are in constant contact with us uh, here, uh, show that Egyptian science is still present. So, what did we do as we move from the end of the 20th century, which closes on uh, our friend Ahmad Zawir receiving his Nobel Prize, to, uh, well, we created, recreated the new Library of Alexandria. Now, I urge you all to go and visit it because it's a center of excellence for the production and dissemination of knowledge and promoting dialogue and understanding. We want it to be a window on Egypt for the world and the region, a window on the world for Egypt and the region, an institution that rises to the challenge of the digital age and a vibrant center of intellectual debate. It is a space of freedom for dialogue between individuals and civilizations. Uh, it's a very beautiful building that has won many awards, and I... Uh, wrote this uh, book once saying a landmark building. But then, uh, yes, you have to see it. This is the building. This is the conference center where we are, which existed before the building. And the building wraps around it with the planetarium and the science complex here underneath. And all of that connected underground with one big building. Uh, the building itself is wrapped around by a granite wall, which has inscriptions of letters from all the alphabets of the world, but no complete words. It has a plaza which is very active, day and night. It's a beautiful building in many ways. And when you go inside the building, if you remove the ceiling, you would see a spine. On this side, we have research institutions and administration. On this side, the library proper. And uh, this is the great reading room. And the architecture is really stunning. But it is much more than a building. What makes the Library of Alexandria what it is is the activities that take place from this conference onwards to other activities and the spirit in which it is done. And the spirit is perhaps best captured by that statue, and that is the Greek sculptor who did it that is there. It is the statue of Prometheus bearing fire to humanity. Prometheus, the demigod, the titan who brought fire to humanity and was punished for having given fire to humanity, uh, but still felt it was the right thing to do. We feel that the Library of Alexandria, like Prometheus, must bring fire of knowledge to humanity. We are very proud of the fact that the library has been welcomed with open arms by Egyptians. We receive an enormous number of visitors, about 1.4 million visitors a year, maybe more this year. And these are big events, as you can see. This is a science event dealing with a, a science fair. Our uh, websites keep increasing the number of attendance. Now we receive almost a million visitors a day, a million hits a day on our websites. And uh, that's not counting Eternal Egypt, which is, has a separate count, which Dr. Fathi Saleh uh, maintains with the ministry. Uh, it's a remarkable site, which I commend to your attention, as well as the Kaltnat site below. 
so even excluding these, it's a lot. We have uh, tens of thousands of children who visit because we start young. Uh, as Tom Mason said, we reach to the little people early on. Here they are, lots of little people. And uh, also for the older people. Uh, we have about uh, 600,000 reader visits a year. We hold about 700 events, of which this is one. So even though this will go on for several days, we still count it as one event in the 700. Much attendance is there. We have concerts, international gatherings. Uh, that 700 doesn't include the art classes uh, or the music classes, for that matter. And, uh, but we encourage to nurture the talents of children, whether they lie in science or in arts. We have become an important national, regional, and international collaboration center. We're a complex of lively institutions, starting with a hybrid library, where knowledge is available online as well as in books, specialized libraries, the Taha Hussein Library for the Blind, where we have very advanced electronics for that, the children's library, the young person's library, 11 to 16, and multimedia library, audiovisuals, rare books, the internet archive, four museums, Sadat Museum, Manuscripts Museum, Antiquities Museum, and the Science Museum. That is the Sadat Museum, the Manuscript Museum, the Antiquities Museum, and the Science Museum with the Planetarium. With the Al Exploratorium, which is a hands-on facility for young people where we encourage them to question everything. But we also have 15 permanent exhibitions which are quasi-museums, except that they don't have formal legal constructs to them. From uh, the art of Muhaddin Hussain to the Arab folk art exhibition of Raya Nemr, to temporary exhibition or temporary galleries, in which right now two of them are now hosting uh, the exhibits of this uh, uh, conference. We have seven institutes and a forum, and an eighth one being formed. The Institutes of Manuscripts start out first, where we digitize manuscripts as well, and you should see the combination of uh, old line scholarship and modern digitization, as well as a series of seminars that produce important publications. We have one that deals with calligraphy and writing. We have a special studies center that organizes international links between Egyptian scientists and their counterparts. We have a center for documentation in Cairo, that is CultNet, that Dr. Fathi Saleh is the head of here, and that has an exhibit downstairs, <coughs> and that has, in fact, patented the first nine-screen interactive computer presentation in the world, the Culturama, and I urge you to visit it while you're here. And uh, ISIS, our International School for Information Science, that does a lot of things, including specialized conferences, of which we are proud to have Wikimania, which I thought was cute to call themselves mania, Wikimania, but this is for, of course, with Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia. So these are the Wikipedians when they are here. And then uh, the art center that organizes the, the uh, schooling for children, also our very own orchestra. We have a special center dealing with uh, Alexandria and the Mediterranean, uh, the history of the city from the ta ancient times to the modern times. We have a dialogue forum that stands for the values of reform that are important that mobilizes Egypt's intellectuals around issues of human rights and freedom of expression with audience participation, and where we have created uh, IT fora to link uh, civil society. We have more than 1,800 NGOs around this Arab info mall. We have new research centers, including a Hellenistic Studies Center, which has just been formed this last year, and is up and running a stream of publications coming out from all these centers. And we are also reissuing the classics of the modern period, while in the manuscript center we are studying the uh, reissuing of the older classics with a special focus on science. But we need to reach more, hence the mass media. I hold a weekly program that is called Salon Qahira, and Dina Bulaila organizes a weekly program about what goes on in the Library of Alexandria, and we created our own little studio here. We've become a venue for eminent intellectuals, including uh, Wally Soyinka, Umberto Eco, Farouk El Baz, eminent political figures, uh, Prime Ministers uh, Michel Rocard of France and uh, Mahathir Mohamed of Malaysia, uh, many distinguished Nobel laureates. And we do research, especially in informatics, and we have a special outreach uh, for the young in the BA Science Festival, for example, 
Uh, with this last year, we had 20,000 people who came for three days, as you can see here. Uh, most importantly, the kids are happy. Look at that expression there. That says it all, I think. But it's still to encourage people, what if? So all the parts really are essential. They reinforce each other. The whole is more than the sum of the part. And that's just the beginning of many alternative possibilities. But for we have created an infrastructure for science. Until about 10 years ago, there was only theoretical science and experimental science. About 10 years ago, we could get computer simulation because computers became good enough for that. And so we've created this infrastructure for science at the library, a hybrid library with 45,000 journals full text, which people can consult immediately, huge computing capability. That is our own supercomputer. Now, supercomputers are special. Uh, they have amazing power. To count as a supercomputer, it must do 10 teraflops or 10,000 billion calculations per second, or else it's just a large computer. So this is a supercomputer. And uh, we make that available for people who do finite analysis, who do uh, bioinformatics, who do, uh, who want to use particle physics calculations, etc. We have an analytical center, which is very advanced, which includes virtual reality immersive techniques, including 3D modeling of uh, 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 complex phenomena. Uh, these are examples of these discussions. This is an application uh, to see the erosion of uh, impact on the Sphinx, showing the red parts are where the, the, the potential at-risk parts are, and the blue parts are those that are uh, uh, least at risk. Analysis of geoscience, medical analysis, uh, of different sites, and even architectural analysis, and this is a pictures, this is a virtual reality navigation inside the library. We have exceptionally large storage devices. This is the Internet Archive. These are called PETA boxes. If you take one of these racks and you take a book of 300 pages and you digitize it, one rack would hold 100 million books. So you can imagine the size of that storage before you. If you use books that are, have pictures and colors and maps, it would hold 12 million books. We assemble these things ourselves. So it's not just that we import them, we assemble them. And la last but not least, of course, we are connected to the rest of the world. And that enables us to say that the digital future is here to link the young future generation, the future Farooq al Baz, the future Jor Saliba, the future Ahmed Zawil, the future uh, uh, Mustafa Said, and so on, with their peers elsewhere. And we are just starting. We're barely seven years old. So, my friends, we are proud to join the artisans of a better future, to commend all knowledge for all people at all times. And I know that working with all of you from all over the world here, we will further that mission, and for that really is so much that we can do for a whole generation and for the whole world. And thank you very much for your patience.